I was scrolling through recent news stories on the environment and I saw a headline that seemed a little bit out of place. The headline said, the world has become greener over the past 33 years. The article was published by a Spanish research institute that highlighted recent peer-reviewed research that revealed a shocking development. Global forests around the planet have been roaring back to life. So much so that in the last 50 years, apparently Currently, 40% of the planet has seen significant increases in leaf cover. As I searched for other sources of information on this story, I realized that NASA has been publishing on this global greening trend for several years. In a separate Boston University report, they compiled satellite data from NASA and estimated that in the last two decades alone, the Earth has seen an increase in leaf area of approximately 5.5 million square kilometers, which is an area of forest approximately equivalent to the entire Amazon rainforest. Apparently, the revitalized forests are having a slightly cooling effect on the climate as well, approximately a quarter degree Celsius over the last 40 years. That's not enough to offset global warming. However, it's more than enough to show up in the data. The revitalization of global forests is also incredibly important to managing the effects of climate change overall because plants absorb and recapture atmospheric carbon dioxide and they use it to produce oxygen which we need to breathe. But global forests also play a vital role in maintaining inland water supplies. But as I looked further into the data, it became clear that this global greening trend is also just getting started. And many scientists expect that this trend will only continue with greater effects through the rest of this century and well beyond. For some reason, when I read this information, it left me with a strange feeling. Like somehow all of this felt like forbidden knowledge, something I wasn't supposed to see. In a media environment that is so focused on negativity and all the real and perceived risks of climate change, could a story as sensationally positive as global greening really be true? And if so, why hadn't we heard about this? But apparently this has been a very well-known scientific trend for a number of years. And yet, as I continued to dig deeper into the data, the truth behind the untold global greening story began to reveal some very interesting truths, both about Earth's climate, as well as our relationship with the news media that shapes public opinion on the topic. Human-created CO2 emissions are an ongoing concern. And despite this, apparently our CO2 level of just over 400 parts per million in today's atmosphere is actually extremely low when you compare it to the last 500 million years of recorded geologic history. In fact, the carbon dioxide level is so low that the plants on our planet are starved for more CO2. In fact, the concentration of CO2 is so low that commercial greenhouse operations have to go out and actually purchase additional CO2 to increase the indoor atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide to between 800 and 1200 parts per million, which is about two to three times the current concentration in today's atmosphere. The pre-industrial concentration of CO2 that was below 200 parts per million would be so damaging to plants and global forests that if the CO2 trend of today were in reverse, and and it threatened to fall any lower than 200 for any sustained period of time, it would be an existential threat to all life on this planet. And yet that's exactly what was happening for the last 100,000 years until the end of the previous ice age. And it was also happening for the 150 million years before that, when CO2 levels in the atmosphere were falling from almost 3,000 parts per million in the Jurassic period and have been gradually falling ever since until basically the other day. Many people may be getting ready to tell me about how the recent increase in CO2 has been dramatic, and they're certainly correct about that. But they should also remember this. Just 20,000 years ago, New York City was covered in a giant glacier over a thousand feet high. This same glacier covered all of New England, most of the upper Midwest, and the entirety of Canada. Around that time, through a process known as orbital forcing, gradually 
gradual changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun, along with its axis of rotation, began to create an era of rising temperatures in the northern hemisphere. These rising temperatures created conditions that led the glaciers to melt. And as the glaciers began to melt, they released stored CO2 from the soil and the ocean into the atmosphere. And the land that was now newly exposed directly to sunlight absorbed even more heat from solar radiation that would have previously reflected off the ice. And that meant that the warming trend that began at the end of the previous ice age began to accelerate. And the warming trend that we're now seeing began long before humans began to contribute to carbon emissions through industrialization. And all of that is very well documented on the geologic records. Those of us that have been following the climate change story have been led to believe that it's happening faster than ever before. And it's very different this time. And it's actually the biggest crisis of the 21st century and beyond. But is that really true? Because in spite of all the alarmist media coverage that predominates the climate change story, shouldn't we at least take a closer look at the wealth of historical data that's been comprised by leading geologists over the last 50 years, just to be sure? Greenland ice core temperature data going back 10,000 years shows a normal frequency of temperature fluctuations where the current temperature increases that we've seen over the past 100 years appear to fit within a fairly normal historical pattern. And when you go back any further and you look at the long-term geological record, you see that the long pattern of temperature fluctuations with extreme fluctuations between minimum and maximum periods is very normal. It's just a part of our Earth's normal regulation that has happened over hundreds of millions of years. But if the level of CO2 today is really low by the standards of long-term geological history, then where did all the CO2 that used to be in the atmosphere all those millions of years ago actually go? Why are the atmospheric CO2 levels so much lower today than they've been throughout most of our history? A big part of the answer is plants. According to data developed by the GeoCarb 3 model, which is a long-term model of atmospheric CO2 developed by Robert Berner and his colleagues at Yale University, the major inflection points of CO2 declines in the geologic record coincide with major evolutionary breakthroughs in the plant kingdom. For example, the emergence of vascular plants around 370 million years ago preceded a massive sea change in atmospheric CO2 levels, where atmospheric CO2 went down from 4,500 to about 500 over the next 40 million years. And it stayed there for about 70 million years after that. At the next peak, about 150 million years ago, the rise of angiosperms led to an era of CO2 declines that took atmospheric CO2 levels from 2,500 to less than 200 across a period of about 150 million years until quite recently. When you look at a chart like this, you can see the locations and key exchanges in the global carbon cycle. And that is how fossil fuels contribute to atmospheric carbon and how that same carbon is recaptured by plants and oceans and stored in carbon sinks. Now, what stands out to me about this chart is you see the amount of carbon in the deep ocean, which is 37,000 gigatons or 37,000 billion tons. You also see the amount of carbon in fossil fuels, which is between 5,000 and 10,000 gigatons. But what about the number below it? Earth's crust, carbonaceous rocks, what in the world is that? Well, it's rock that was formed by living things. But what does that mean? Apparently, a lot of it is seashells. Not just seashells specifically, but more broadly, the carbonate shells of marine organisms. Carbon that was absorbed into the sea that was used through an infinitely complex process of evolution by sea creatures that decided it would be a really good idea to create a hard armor shell to protect their soft and otherwise vulnerable bodies. Apparently this idea of carbonate shells started to catch on and became all the rage. Everybody was doing it. Crabs, lobsters, snails, starfish, sea urchins, oysters, clams, 
mussels, even algae, plankton, and about half of all the carbonaceous rock came from just one category of marine life, which is coral. The point is the plants weren't the only ones who cared about using CO2 to their advantage. They had some friends in the sea as well. And sadly, a lot of those friends are no longer with us. Our bygone aquatic friends left layers of carbonate rock that now comprises about 100 million gigatons of stored carbon, which is approximately 15% of the entire Earth's crust. And this carbonate rock is a long-term carbon sink, which means that it's mostly out of play as far as any future carbon emissions. And that carbon is unlikely to return to the atmosphere forever. Now, I get it. I hear you. But Alex, are you saying that CO2 emissions are a good thing? Are you a climate skeptic? Or even worse, are you a climate denier? And Alex, if you care so much about the plants and the crustaceans, do you care that much about humans too? Because how can humans survive if CO2 levels go from 400 to 800 or even higher? Well, the answer to whether humans can survive higher CO2 levels is that we already are. CO2 levels inside office buildings routinely rise to 2,500 parts per million, and we don't even notice it. That's just to give you an idea, that is six times the current atmospheric concentration. The bigger point about the global greening story in the long-term context of carbon cycles is that whatever your personal feelings may be, isn't this a story that's at least worth discussing? And yet, for some reason, it's almost never discussed in the news. And most of the climate coverage that we see has a decidedly negative outlook. But why? Well, the answer is that global greening is good news and news media companies go broke reporting on good news, literally. See, there's a concept that's really important to understand in human psychology, it's called negativity bias. What it says is that humans naturally pay way more attention to negativity and risk in the environment, even if it means that we ignore the good things that are in fact much more significant. News media companies basically sell your attention to advertisers and so the importance of gaining your attention is not lost on them. There's a saying in the newsroom, if it bleeds, it leads. Basically, the most shocking and emotionally alarming stories lead the news as a rule. Negativity bias in media has been studied extensively over the years, and a recent report with the appropriate title of Negativity Drives Online News Consumption added some significant data relating to online news. The study took a list of news stories and tested them with 105,000 different headlines. And these headlines were presented 370 million times to different online viewers, and they captured 5.7 million clicks. What they're trying to do in the study is find out how do positive and negative words in news headlines affect the likelihood that a viewer actually clicks the story and decides to read it. What they found was that even though positive words were more common in headlines than negative words, positive words tended to repel audience attention, while negative words tended to attract it. In fact, every negative word increased click-through rates by 2.3% on average. And this was a linear relationship, which means that the more negative keywords that there were, the more likely it was that a viewer was going to click the story. What's even more remarkable is that the impact of positive and negative keywords on click-through rates was consistent even when the underlying story was the same. Moreover, the effectiveness of negative keywords was particularly strong in news stories related to politics and the economy. So in the current media landscape where objective scientific topics such as environmental science have become politicized, you can see why a climate story with far-reaching positive impact, like the global greening story, is unlikely to receive significant coverage, even though it's potentially the biggest climate story of the 21st century. Covering this story hurts news outlets both short-term and long-term. Short-term, it's generally a positive story, and so because it's less likely to compel viewers to read it, it's likely to lower ad revenue that the media company will generate. And covering this story also hurts them long-term because it takes a bite out of their primary climate change news franchise, which is predicated on the negative effects of climate change while mostly dis 
disregarding the positive effects. And you might be thinking, Alex, no way. My news outlet is better than that. I watch Fox. I watch CNN. They're honest. And if it really was the story that you say it is, they would definitely report on it. Look, if that's what you think, then I'm not as confident as you are. Because look, I'm sure that you're right. They'd be inclined to cover any important news story. But if they have second thoughts when it comes to publishing positive news stories, it's only because they know what happens to the news companies that do, which is that they have a tendency to go broke. Russian news site City Reporter ran an experiment where they only published positive news for an entire day. So all their headlines said stuff like, hey, no disruption on the road because of snow. And so the experiment was only able to last a single day because when they ran exclusively positive headlines, what they found was that they actually lost two thirds of their entire viewership in one day. So look, why am I doing this video? What's the whole point of all this? Well, first of all, thanks for asking. My point is this. For one, and I know this may come as a disappointment for some, but carbon dioxide is not fundamentally a political issue. It's a gas that occurs naturally in Earth's atmosphere. However, it's also a gas that has far-reaching effects on life on this planet, which makes it a very important thing to understand and to discuss openly. Which brings me to my second point, which is that the news media coverage about the climate is intended to appear over negative and alarmist by design. And I'm not saying that human-induced carbon emissions are good, that climate change isn't real, or that we should disregard the truth behind negative headlines. I think it's a big topic, and I think we have to get organized around sustainable policies. But what I am saying is that whenever there is good news impacting the global climate change story, you're unlikely to hear about it on the news. But just because that may be true does not mean that the good news isn't real. And it also doesn't mean that you shouldn't be optimistic about the future. If you like this video and you want to learn more about another big trend affecting the U.S. housing market, click this link below to learn more about the affordable housing conspiracy. And believe me, you might be surprised by what you learn.